Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. Yes, um, I'm joined today, as you'll have noticed, by current student Iliad. Um, do you want to say hello? Um, um, hi. Um, I think can everyone hear me? I guess. Um, yeah. So there's there's a 20 second lag. So we'll find out in 20 seconds whether I've remembered to unmute everything that's going on today. Um, <laughs> joining us today, as well as Iliad, are two current students, Christian and Lauren, who are going to be keeping an eye on chats underneath here maybe answering questions, maybe talking to people about what it's like being a current student. I should say chat, which is now filling up with people saying hello, shut up, hello to Sophia and Sebastian and an anonymous person and Robert Hook. They can all hear us. <laughs> so, <laughs> notes for people That's good to know. <laughs> good to yeah. know, even Robert Hook. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> notes for people uh, joining us for the first time. Great to have you with us. Um, this is the Oxford Maths Club online. Um, we're going to do some maths problems. We're going to show you some bits and pieces of mathematics. Um, if you want to hang out in chat, um, that's at slido.com slash OOMC while we're live. Um, if you want to talk to uh, other other people or about about the problems that we're going to do today um, or talk to the current students about stuff, you can even talk to, them about them about, talk to them about stuff that's not related to what's on the screen or if you just want to suggest answers to math things. And I'm going to try and run some polls today. So over in Slido, um, where the questions got like multiple, multiple, like a clear set of options, I'm going to try and run a poll. So there's going to be some audience interaction in that form. Uh, last week, lots of people wanted a poll. There's a popular request. Um, this week, I'm going to do a poll. Um, so people are saying hello. I can't say hello back to everyone. I'm going to shout out people who are on screen now, which is Celia. Hi. Hi, Faith. Hi, Fiza. Um, your comments are moderated and will appear on the live stream feed. So. Please don't divide by zero or swear. Right, cool. Um, okay, um, so I've brought Ithiad on to talk about some maths problems, um, which we're going to get to in a moment. Do you want to say anything before I tell them the title? Or <laughs> should, we just, should we go for it? We should, we should just go in, I guess. Yeah, let's just go in. Um, okay. So the title is Cute Olympiad Maths. And I'll... I'll, I'll do a brief introduction that this was pitched to me as Olympiad problems, but we're going to make it sort of fun or uh, in Olympiad problems that we can get stuck into. Um, I hope that's a sort of fair description of what we're about to do. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, a lot of people are asking about the definition of cute. Um, I guess the definition in this case is um, they're just fun to try. Um, that's quite vague, but um, I guess that's the definition we'll stick with for the moment. Do you, want to, do you want to explain what your experience of Olympiad maths is? Um, well, in my experience, like uh, there's like a couple of categories of Olympiad problems. Some are really ugly, especially like number theory problems. Um, well, they're ugly because I don't, I can't really solve them, so I'm quite biased. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the cute problems are the ones that are quite difficult, but still have like two or three line solutions. And if you can like find the solution, it's really nice and fun and like, it's a good feeling to have. But if you can't find the solution to the problem and then you just, then you read the solution that, oh, it's just two lines and I spent like five hours on this problem. That's quite frustrating. So it can be a double-edged sword, but um, they're just fun problems. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, we've already got the, I warned you about this, we've already got the standard guest question. What A-levels did you do? Uh, I did none. Yes, that's the answer. Um, so do you want to give more context there or <laughs> just leave that yeah, as a mystery? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did not do the A-levels because I'm from Bangladesh and we do like some other curriculum. So yeah, that's the context. Okay. And you represented Bangladesh at the International Maths Olympiad, right? I wasn't. Yeah, I, I went to the IMO in 2019 and 2020. Ah, okay, and you're a first year Oxford student at the moment. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a first year student at Mansfield College. Uh, I'm doing maths, obviously. Brilliant. Yes, no, sorry, <laughs> that was brilliant. I got distracted by something someone said in chat. Someone posted an answer to a question. And we haven't answered the questions yet. Should we ask them? Should we put them a question? Should we set them a question? I think that's a pun. Um, oh, Seventy it's a pun. degrees. Yes. I have to read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If... <laughs> it's 
going to be one of those one of those live streams. Right, let's give them a question. Okay. Oh, this slide says, in chat today, Lauren and Christian, you know Lauren and Christian. Lauren and Christian have both been on live stream before to present maths and to talk to people about maths. People are now saying hello from all over the world as well, which is nice. Um, Sebastian wants to su suggest a problem. We've got some prepared. If you want to suggest one in chat, then we'll get to it if we've got time, I suppose, as well. Right, okay. Let's give them from one. Here we go. Do you want to read it out? Yes. Um, so problem one, uh, we have two concentric squares of side length one. So basically the squares have length one, which is self-explanatory. Um, and the con word concentric means that uh, the center of the squares are the same. And we define the center of a, of a square as the intersection of the diagonals. So if you like draw the four diagonals in the problem, they will intersect in the same point. So that's the setup of the geometry. Um, and we have to prove that regardless of what angle they're tilted at, uh, the common area is more than three by four. Okay, so common area here, just because we've got these slides on my computer so that I can scribble inside them. The common area is the bit that's sort of inside both of them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So if, if the squares were like exactly on top of each other, the common area would be um, one, but they could also be less than one, as in the image. Uh, we have to prove that, regardless of the angle, it's always more than two by four. Cool. Um, OK, so I think we should give people a minute to uh, <laughs> think about this. I don't have a multiple choice poll for this one, because it's a proof that question. We're looking for a, a good reason why the common area is more than three quarters. Um, Uh, somebody's asked in the meantime though while we're while we're giving people a minute to have a go at thinking about maybe thinking about how they'd approach this problem i'm not sure if we're quite going to give you time to do uh to do the problem entirely but um well while, while we're waiting somebody would like to know what o levels you did <laughs> somebody i think somebody's looked up <laughs> the Bangladesh equivalent of the a level standard a level question um i think i did like 14 subjects that's a long list too <laughs> that's, yeah. that's tricky to compare with a levels you did uh -huh. some maths, um, right? I, I did do some maths um i wasn't very good at it but um yeah right um so one of the ideas of this problem is to um like think about uh, like naming naming random variables to like, not random variables but like variables to this um <laughs> I, I did I did probably so random variable means something else now. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, an an approach would be to like think about the little triangles. So we have um, I think eight different tri eight triangles and um, not not these ones like the ones that's that are sticking out. The triangles that are sticking out. Oh, you want these triangles on the outside. Yeah, yeah. So this triangle, there are, there are eight triangles, and all of them are like congruent to each other by symmetry. Like you can mm, prove that fairly easily. So one approach of, uh, to the problem would be to figure out the area of those small triangles and then subtract one minus four times that, because um, the common area would be uh, one minus four times that, basically. So that could be a strategy to this problem. So we found and mm -hmm. if we found maybe these lengths in terms of theta, some angle or something, or we did some trigonometry, maybe, maybe uh, then we can find the some find some triangle areas, do some subtraction, and then we've got some inequalities to do. I kind of think kind of feels a little bit like something I could maybe do on a maths question that I could get people on the map to do some sort of trigonometry, find some find some lengths, find some angles. Maybe yeah. I'll put some help in a bit and do some inequality stuff to show that that's less than three over, no, more than three over four. Um, um, so, so someone in the chat mentioned like uh, a strategy to divide the common area into four equal um, areas. Yeah, I think that's what I started drawing, right? This, I, uh, yeah. I was thinking of it as well, since the question is about the common area. I was gonna do it like into eight like this, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think those are, I was going to say, I think those are triangles. You wouldn't know from my drawing. Um, possibly not isosceles triangles. 
Um, no, they're, they're definitely not isosceles if the angle, if the like uh, angle in angle is not um, 45 degrees. Okay. <laughs> so there's a pretty tricky question here as well to find some lengths yeah. and areas of some triangles. Um, somebody's asked for top top tips in terms of extracurricular bits of maths and well you're in the right place um, one of the ideas of the Oxford Online Maths Club is that we're doing extra bits of maths that you don't see in the classroom if you're interested in maths and stats at university then um, seeing extra bits of maths and statistics like this is maybe a good place to start and find some stuff to be interested in um, Am I allowed to plug the YouTube channel in the middle of a video that's on the YouTube channel? Check out this YouTube channel for more, <laughs> for more interesting videos, including all the previous live streams we've done in this season of Oxford Online Maths Club. Um, yeah, Fees is worried about the corners of the inside shape. Um, something about the corners not being the corners not being triangles. I think my draw. I think my drawing is really bad. I think I've done a very bad job of explaining which bits, which bits I wanted to find. And it's kind of like if you took these points, these eight points here, and you join them. This is my plan anyway, which I'm not quite doing on the board because I'm slightly too lazy to do it on the board. If you take these points and join them all to the centre, then I'll get eight different triangles. Maybe they're all congruent or or something. Get eight, these eight different triangles. Find their areas. Add it all up through that's less bigger than three over four. Ah. Um, an interesting thing about the octagon is that the side lengths are equal, but that's, that doesn't mean that it's a regular octagon because it doesn't have to be. Right, okay. So there's this concept yeah. of all the sides are the same length, but the angles could be different. Um, that's not a yeah. thing for triangles, but it is a thing for shapes with no sides. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a past Matt's question about a hexagon that has equal length sides, but uh, different angles in the corners. Um, yeah, uh, there there were there were a lot of um, IMO questions with equal side lengths of hexagons as well. Like I'm like uh, the 1990s IMO really liked hexagons. <laughs> <laughs> hexagons are the best. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've I've convinced Fiza at least I've, I've achieved one thing. I've convinced Fiza that my picture does have triangles in, which is great news for my drawing skills. Um, the distance to the center for each of these things, um, I think it might be the same, might not be. This diagram makes it look like they're the same, but maybe these lines are, are different. I think if, uh, oh. No, I can't even convince myself if these are isosceles triangles or not. I think they're not. Um, and we've got some suggestions. Can we find the area? This one's got three thumbs ups, so I'm going to read this one out. Can we find the area where the common area is smallest? One square is 45 degree tilted and show that it's greater than three quarters. Um, so um, else to look at the special we, we could do that, but we would have to prove that that's the smallest case first. That um, we have to find the area and then prove that it's the smallest because well, we always need to have a proof of our assertions. Yeah. And I think I can sort of see where people are coming from with this. The, if you, as you rotate them, when they're, when they're perfectly lined up, everything's inside both. So it kind of makes sense to me that halfway in between, there's some sort of maximum or minima about what's mm -hmm. going on there. So that's kind of some critical point. Um, I can do that kind of hand wavy argument. Um, I'm an applied yeah. mathematician, so that's convincing enough for me. Um, I yeah. suspect in some sort of Olympiad setting, you might need to prove that there isn't weirdly some other special case that's important, mm -hmm. like, like 22 um, and a half degrees um, or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we could definitely like, like name a bunch of variables and do some calculus with it to find the minima slash maxima and do we solve it as a minima maxima problem. But um, that, would, that, that wouldn't that would make it a cute problem. That like that would definitely make it um, ugly, in my <laughs> opinion. Yeah. Not that I hate calculus, but it, it has its place, but I'm not here at the moment. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Some of them are, so, some of the people in chat watching live um, are having a go at the forty-five degree case. I think um, because it's, it's seem to be a, a club of people having a go at that. Uh, there's a suggestion. If, it, if it's sorry, if it's forty-five, um, it will be a regular a regular um, octagon. 
yeah, weirdly, my picture, <laughs> I've got two diagrams on the board. The one where it's not a regular octagon looks more regular than my picture where it is supposed to be a regular octagon, but oh well. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so in that special case, um, um, mm -hmm. it's much nicer. And um, like, uh, we could solve that by considering like doing Pythagoras because the length, like the, the hypotenuse, if the hypotenuse is X, then the other two parts should be like, uh, uh, if the short ones are x, the hypotenuse should be root x times root two. So one is equal to x plus x plus x root two. And then we can just find what x is. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we could do some, do some nice little bit of, that feels more like a match problem to me. Um, yeah. Someone in the chat says it's gone blurry, which is a bitrate problem, and I'm fiddling with YouTube live streaming settings behind the scenes while also trying to draw octagons. Um, oh, right, let's try and keep up with that. We had massive tech issues. Okay, a couple of people are not, we are not not seeing blurry vision. Um, I'll try and talk clearly because it, it usually seems that the audio the audio stays even if the video feed goes pretty bad. So we'll remember that. Um, do you want to show them a trick? Um, I'll, I'll just give him the hint. Uh, so, what if you think about the squares as rotating? I'll, I'll tell you that. So, like, we have to solve the problem. Um, we have to solve the problem uh, in all the cases. So, what if we have we think about rotating the one of the squares um, clockwise or counterclockwise? Yeah, counterclockwise. Always the best direction. Uh, yeah. So, what's um, and like if we have some kind of like paint on the, uh, I don't know, on the squares, like side left sides of the squares, what would the trace be of the um, thing that's moving? Okay. So this is a clue. Maybe that's a hint. <laughs> this is a clue. Yeah. If you... If you imagine one of the squares stationary and one of them rotating, then you can imagine. If you can imagine that well enough, then you're imagining all possible cases. Um, and if you have a clue there is, uh, imagine what shapes get traced out by the outside. Uh, <laughs> um, um, ah, people are put. People are talking about con circles or putting a circle around the outside for. So as you move this, as you rotate the square, the corners will stay on some circle. That's true. Oh, yeah. Maybe we should draw that circle. Do you want to draw the one the outside that's, circle? That, yeah, that's the circumcircle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I offered to draw that and re realized, as I said it, that I've got to go through eight points. There's a circle going through eight ah. points. Almost, right? No, I. Oh, 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 oh dear. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get it on lap two. <laughs> Perfect. Yay. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so that's that's a unit circle with area pi. People are talking about pi, but that's not the included area, right? That purple circle is huge. Um, mm -hmm. It contains the kind of included area. It's. I don't think it's the unit circle though. Is it? Uh, oh, it might be root two times the unit circle. Yeah, yeah it's, it's root two times the unit circle. Mm -hmm. Or root two over two oh, in radius. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's related to yeah, it's related to. Well, it's a big. That's a big right. circle. The common area. The common area. I suppose we could say the common area lies inside that circle, where yeah. however we do the rotation. So the common area is less than the area of this purple circle. Yeah, but and that's not very helpful because the area of the purple circle is more than one. And we already know that the common area must be less than one. Yeah. But so, it's, it's it's a step. Yeah. Uh, an anonymous person in chat um, has Ooh. said, if you think of a circle inside, then the minimum area would be radius one half, um, which is bigger than three quarters. That's an interesting observation. Interesting. Somebody else has said pi equals three, which is pretty much a uh, pretty much a, an observation. And somebody mm -hmm. wants me to have some shape drawing lessons, which sounds sounds fun. Right, okay. Luckily the next bit the next slide doesn't rely on my shape drawing skills at all. Um because we've got a nice animation that you made, right? <laughs> Should we play the animation? Yes. We'll play the animation. So I think someone's had it in chat uh, to try and illustrate this. 
okay, this might set my computer on fire. We're going to give it a go. Might, we might go blurry. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. My computer's making a noise like a jet plane taking off. And, and a square's rotating, but there's this circle on the inside that stays inside both squares as that rotation happens. So the included area must include all of this circle. Um, the circle has got radius one half, so it's got area pi over four. Pi over four is bigger than three over four. So the area includes, includes a bit that's at least three quarters inside. Yeah. Brill. And um and, and for and if you like the, the proof is basically um you draw the you draw the perpendicular to the eight sides from the center and they're all going to be one half. So the circle of radius one half is going to touch the two squares and it's basically a common in circle. And since it's a common in circle, it's inside both the squares, and so the, that's how we prove the problem. Um so well, the... notice that it's uh it could be that the bow, the actual bound is uh, more than pi by four because like uh, someone was mentioning that the minimum case, the, the worst case is like uh, 45 degrees and we still have some bits uh, around the outside the circles. So the actual bound is probably more than that. Uh, but yeah, for I sort of I sort of I think I expect the actual bounds to have nothing to do with pi is my intuition here, but I don't I don't know if that's actually backed up by the actual area. Yeah. I suppose people who are doing this question, the kind of honest forwards direction kind of way of doing this question of finding that area at 45 degrees. Yeah, I kind of expect that to have loads of things to do with roots too and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, one of the funny things about this problem is that the answer we got is uh, uh, a stronger bound than the, the question than what the question asked, and it, it, it's quite funny because if we ask them, if if you ask anyone to prove the common area is more than pi by four, they would start thinking about circles because pi is related to circles. But just by making the problem a bit weaker, we uh, just take away the like the major hint of the problem, and it makes the um, the the weaker problem is kind of harder, which is quite um, interesting. <laughs> You've tried. You've tried this. You've tried both versions of this problem, right? You did a test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, in one of the math, um, uh, in one of the math camps, um, we divided the people into two groups and gave them gave them the problem uh, with one, gave one of the groups with the problem with five by four and the other group with um, three by four. And the five by four group solved like it inst almost instantly. The three by four group not quite. So it's like statistically proven that the problem is harder with uh, three by four in it. <laughs> Yeah, not always the harder mathematical statements that are harder to prove. Okay, mm -hmm. Let, let's do let's do another. So, yeah, the structure here is we're doing lots of different problems uh, that aren't related. Um, cool. Okay, ants problem. Do you want to describe yes. the ants problem? I think I'll play the animation as well, shall I? Yeah. So there are like um, in ants on a rope of like let's say uh, of the rope it has length ten meters. Um, I couldn't animate the ants because I'm not a good animator. So you just have to imagine that. And they're all moving at one meters per second. If two ants bump into each other, like as in the animation, they just um, reverse the direction. If they reach the end of the rope, they fall, as in like, they're falling right now. And the question basically asked is that, how long can we make the ants stay on the rope? Um, if the... Ah, that's nice. Someone has seen this question before. Um, that's good. I'm gonna Don't play spoil the it for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So if you've seen this, if you've seen the question before, try to imagine what it was like before you'd seen the answer to the question, and don't spoil it for everyone else yet. I'm gonna get there. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to run a poll for this one because I thought I could. Um, I have a poll for people so in chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, for how long it takes, I suppose. It kind of depends on where the ants start, I suppose, or in, and which direction yeah. the little ants are facing. Um, but if, if we have there? like one, if we have like, the, in the simplest case, if we have one ant and it starts at the, uh, at the very end, um, it will take them exactly 10 seconds to cross over. 
Well, what happens if we have like more than one end and let's say two or three or four, it gets more complex, doesn't it? Yeah, so I guess, yeah, maybe I haven't set the options up in my poll very well because <laughs> already we've eliminated <laughs> some of my options. Oh no. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I thought, so it's it's a challenge to turn these problems into multiple choice questions. Olympia problems are not multiple choice. Uh, my options were going to be, could be anything up to one second, could be anything up to two seconds, five, anything up to ten, or more than ten. And I suppose now we've given an example where it takes exactly ten. So let's, let's reduce the options a bit. It's either going to be, oh, okay, okay. Anything up to ten seconds, or maybe, maybe it takes more than ten seconds. Um, maybe the mm -hmm. ants can um slow each other down right like um if you have yeah. ant bouncing ant bouncing stuff going on maybe it could be that as n rises as we have more ants on the rope we um we have less ants staying on the rope like, like the answer is less and the answer gets less sir um it could be that or it could be that the the answer making them stay on the board by like flashing into each other more Maya would like to know, can multiple ants start at the same spot? It's a really good question. Um, I don't think physics allows us to do that. <laughs> okay, yet. we're going to say no for physics reasons. I'm not sure the maths goes wrong. Um, we're going to say no for physics reasons. Um, so it could be one second. Yeah, it could be one second, says Fisa, if one ant is really near the edge. Um, I mean, it could be half a second if that ant is really, really near the edge already. Um, I guess we're looking for an upper bound here. And someone's pointed out that my options are not mutually exclusive in my poll, um, which is true, but that's due to bad poll design. Whoops. <laughs> God, I'm really getting, really getting dunked on today. I like, can't draw shapes, can't set up polls. <laughs> um... Cool. Um, the voting is currently it's secret voting because I like I like having it so that people's votes aren't influenced by what other people are voting for. But it is currently exactly fifty fifty between could take more than ten seconds and will the option that should be definitely done within ten seconds. Um, those are those are equally equally selected by the audience. So I guess half of the room kind of virtual room around the world. Half of the virtual room thinks that there's a setup where you can, if you set up enough ants, then maybe you can keep one of them on the string for on the rope for more than 10 seconds. And the other half of the, of the room thinks that, no, wherever you put the ants, wherever you start them, they're all going to be off the rope within 10 seconds. Uh... Um, maybe we should try to solve the problem for n equals to two. And see if it, if that leads anywhere. Okay, I'm gonna try and draw a picture yeah. for that. No shapes, so I'm safe. Um, oh, I'm gonna do yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because I know that some physics people watch this, I'm gonna do a little space time diagram. This probably won't make any sense to the non physicists, but hey, it's got time going up the y axis. What's going on there? Um, but if you've done like any sort of particle physics stuff, or if you're interested in tracking like special relativity things, you might seen like. You could have like a red ant coming in this way and a green ant coming in this way and then they bounce off each other. So they bounce off each other like that. This is like a very, very basic scattering problem. Oh, I love physics. Right, scattering problem and then they split out again. So I could maybe keep them in like this and then I've got to work out if you start here and you start there, what's going on? After you've scattered, how long, how long does it take before we get to this kind of point? I guess what do I want? I want kind of this point where it gets to zero or 10 meters or something. Right, I've mumbled about space time diagrams for about a minute on, on air. <laughs> um, so uh, I've, I've hidden chat on the live stream, but people in the slide, they can see chat. Um, I'm going to read out a couple of things. Um, wouldn't both ants turning around have the same effect as both ants carrying on through each other? says someone in chat and they're anonymous, which... That's interesting, huh? Two ants bumping into work? each other and changing direction is the same as if they just walk past each other, says someone. I guess they're thinking that because the ants... Because the ants... Um, you know, I'm sure the ants 
their own individual um, creatures, but because they're kind of indistinguishable to us I mean, in terms of staying on the rope, that um, we don't really mind if they've got mixed up. They're all going at the same speed, so well, they've, mm -hmm. well, they bounce, they could go through each other. Uh... Should, we, should we show the animation then? <laughs> Charlie's question is perfect, which is, do we achieve each collision between two ants has the coefficient of restitution one? Which, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the perfect physics question. I love it. Right, good. Okay. Um, let's show them the animation. You had an animation for this to try and demonstrate this point. Let's go. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk over it? So in the bottom, two ants, they're distinguishable, yeah. bounce off each other. In the top. And... Um... The ants, the ants without the ants without um, without their colours. So these pictures kind of look different because in one ones are distinguished and the other the ants are not distinguished. Um, but in terms of how long it takes for the ants to get off the get off the rope, um, it's it's the same if we allow the ants to walk through each other. In mm -hmm. terms of just where ants are. Um, okay, why is that? Why is that help? Um, that, that, that makes the problem like significantly easier because the hard part of this problem was tracking where one ant goes. And since it's like bumping into um, other ants, the path of a single ant is really um, chaotic. And as n gets large, it's, it's, I think it's quite impossible to like um, figure out what a single ant's path is. But if we like convert the problem this way and, and we think about the collision, collisions of two ants being um, having the same effect as just passing through, then uh, an ant just passes through all the other ants and just falls off the other end. And every ant does the same thing. So everyone has to every every everything has to get off the has to be off the rope within ten seconds. Yeah, because of because of this argument, right? That it's quite subtle. It's sort of like um, if you had a movie. If you had a movie with with the ant staying on the rope for more than ten seconds, then I can come through and repaint the ants so that instead of bouncing off each other, I I, I recolor all the ants so that they're passing through each other instead. Um, and I've got to do that really carefully because I've got to track. You've got all these collisions happening in your video of the ants, um, but I've got to track like oh, that first this happens, so now I've changed which color these ones are, so then later on when they crash over there, I need to change those colors to reflect that as well. I could change lots of change the colours all the way through, and make that into a video of lots of ants passing through each other. But hang on, the ants are going at one meter per second, and there's only ten, ten meters of space, so they're going to run out of space in ten seconds. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, um, the audience was pretty split on that one. Um, in terms of voting, but anything up to ten seconds has eventually won on the yeah. on the live poll. Cool. Right. The, the, the fun uh, the fun thing about the problem was that. The first time I heard about it was um, when a twin was teaching us in like 2016, and they um, they phrased the problem in terms of like people. And um, when they were talking about the solution, they were saying like, "Oh, our souls just change uh, from body when we collide, and so it's like it's the same thing." And since they were twins, that was um, kind of funny. Anyway, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> The real philosophy there as well. Um, somebody suggested we simulate it, or we we try ten ants that are equally spaced. Here's what happens if you if you have uh, some ants that are equally spaced. Um, so I'm drawing this in black and white first. So if you set them off in random directions, then you get something like this. These lines are supposed to be parallel. Where crucially, this ant, if this is the red ant, and it bounces off like this before eventually falling off the edge. But this picture of the lines. You know, if you look at this picture in black and white, then it's a bunch of parallel lines that cross over each other, and every one of these parallel lines ends up, ends up off the off the end within ten seconds. Um, so there's this way of having the ants be distinguishable, so you could color them in. But then if you look at the look at the picture in black and white, then you reveal this kind of structure that's just parallel lines that cross over each other and eventually leave. Okay. Good. Um, uh, so someone someone's mentioning that I hope that the ants don't die when they fall off. Um, I think they don't because like I saw a Kurzgesagt video once about what would happen if like an ant falls from a hundred story building and basically nothing because of air resistance. So I hope they're okay. Yeah, they should be okay. <laughs> they're fine. 
if the problem has air resistance. Uh, right, okay, air resistance. Suddenly we're doing fluid dynamics. My, my, my topic. Cool. Right. I've realised we're t we're spending. We I love these problems, and we're spending slightly longer on them than I than I planned. So I'm going to try and move on move on faster, so we can yeah. show get through get through more problems. This waffly bit that I'm doing now is not helpful. Right. Okay. Let's go. Uh, it's the monk's problem. Yes, the famous monk problem. So, um, a monk is is going to the top of a mountain to um, do something monk stuff, um, and he starts his climb at eight a.m. in the morning and reaches the top at twelve p.m. He then spends the whole day at the top and spends his night there as well. The next day, he starts going down at eight a.m. and reaches the bottom of the mountain, reaches the bottom at twelve p.m. Like um, as we can see in the animation, he's going up. Um, and then in the next animation, we're seeing he's going down. And it's given that there is like a single trail to the top of the mountain. And we have to prove that there is a time on both days where he was at the same point of the climb. All right, so there's some point at some time of the day where he's at the, the same point of the mountain, same point in the mountain trail at that time. Yeah. Like maybe it's like three o'clock or something. So uh, if you if if it's like a space time diag diagram, then it's um, exactly the point. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was already thinking. Can I get another space time diagram into this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe maybe that space time diagram on the previous question was too much of a too much of a powerful tool. Um, so th this problem doesn't give you any information about the shape of the mountain trail or information about how high the mountain is or. What the trail looks like. Yeah. It's just this one unique yeah, it, trail. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it's quite an interesting thing to like um, see that um, the problem is quite arbitrary. We don't. We only have like five pieces of information: uh, the time when he starts his first journey, the time when he ends, and on the same thing on the second day. And the other, the fifth information is that um, there is a just just one trail to the top of the mountain. And we have so many variables that could change that the mountain could be shaped like, I don't know, the Everest or some small hill, or maybe it's like a negatively downhill mountain. I don't know if that exists or something. <laughs> it, it could be a peak, like the Grand Canyon or something. <laughs> okay, right. Or a canyon, or as we now call them, a negatively downhill mountain. <laughs> Brill. <laughs> Um, oh, someone God. said it's got. Someone said this problem's got pigeonhole principle energy, which I like. I mean, it's kind of not the pigeonhole principle. I don't know a way to do it with the pigeonhole principle, but I'm I'm kind of imagining a version with um, three uh, paths and ten monks or something. With... Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of pigeonhole principle e because uh, it's an existence proof, and pigeonhole principle like um, gives us existence proofs and not like constructive proofs. So it, right, it has okay. that same kind of energy. In that sense, yeah. I'm trying to think. Have we done anything else non-constructive on the um, on the live stream this season already? I think just the pigeonhole principle is just our experience of having something where you prove that something exists or happens, but you can't say what it is or where it is. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of um, existence proofs in this um, live stream. Mm. <laughs> uh, Fees has got a plot twist about time zones, which has reminded me that clocks go back or forwards or one of them on Sunday. Um, so watch out for that in the UK. Um, if you're watching in a time zone that does daylight saving in a different way to the UK, then you might find that next week's live stream is not quite at the time you're expecting. <laughs> We're going to be at 4.30 UK time, even if UK time changes. Um, um, this... we, we don't really know if it could be like exactly 10 a.m. because we don't know how fast the monk is going. It could be that the monk just stays at the bottom from 8, 8 a.m. to 11, and then just runs to the top of the mountain uh, in one hour. It could be that he he runs up to the top in uh, one hour and then stays at the top for three hours. We don't know anything about the uh, about how the monk is making the climb or making the descent. We just yes. know that he starts at, at 8 a.m. and reaches the top at 12 p.m. I guess so it's... It's 10 a.m. if he goes at a constant rate in both directions. But if he if he yeah. does something more complicated, mm -hmm. um, or I if mean, he does one he could... thing on the way up and a different thing on the way down, then, uh, yeah, then could he be... could even be going backwards for a couple of minutes. Right. So this is the thing: can we assume he walks at the same speed? We're not going to assume that he walks at the same speed. Yeah. So this is going to be different from the ants problem in that way, I suppose. 
with mathematicians who try and have it both ways, right? Like we, we want to yeah. assert at one point that all ants walk at the same speed yeah. and then yeah. whiplash and a minute later, we're asserting that yeah. monks can run up mountains if they want to. Um, if, if we assume that the, if we assume he walks at the same speed, we're specializing the problem and um, we're solving a special case. But if we make a general argument, that solves the problem for every case and that case included. So general arguments are always more fun and more mathy, I guess. Yeah, Raphael wants to draw some space time diagrams. That's pretty much where I would want to go with this. Um, draw some space time diagrams and prove that yeah. then you're trying to prove that there's a point where you know, point in space time where things collide um, and some other people have put very convincing arguments that i've been not reading out just in case anybody's still trying out the problem um, but i think every 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 solution i've seen so far looks pretty pretty correct um i feel i love this i love the suggestion that we could try and work out um, we could try and make it more physical, right? We could work out the gradients and work out a kind of realistic model about how the monk climbs the mountain. It turns out that this problem is really weird. It doesn't depend on the kind of physical details of how the monk does it. But like this fact is going to be true, it turns out, even if the monk's doing something mad on the way up and something yeah. crazy on the way down. It, it, like if, if the function, if the uh, mountain had the shape of the Weierstrass function, the problem would still work. <laughs> now we've got to explain the Weierstrass function. Let's not explain the Weierstrass uh, function. Or do you want to explain the Weierstrass function while I read out this message from uh, Charlie? It's it's a function that's um, continuous at every point, but differential that difference will nowhere. I think. Yeah, yeah. Looks yeah. like a little more. Um, yeah, Charlie's got an argument about um, at any particular time going down, he's either past the point, which is not what we're looking for yet, or at the same point, or not yet reached the same point. Um, so at some point, at some point, there must be a middle point where it crosses over, I guess, from one to the other. I think that's kind of the kind of the argument from people sending two monks around as well. Um, ah, and somebody's doing the thing where they try to get lots of likes in Slido. So good luck to them. Um, <laughs> right, uh, should we show them the animation that you made for how the solution works? You could talk, talk over it as well, I guess. Yeah. Um, oh goodness. So, this one? Uh, so I think, yeah, it's this one. I'm not sure because they all serve the same way. <laughs> they do, don't they? Yeah. And I'm struggling to make this one work. Um, we, one. We're doing, uh, we're going to do some kind of a space diagram. It's not exactly a space time diagram. It's not exactly a space time diagram, but it's similar, I think. I think I've yeah. opened your video, so I'm opening it in a different Oh, way. no. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. <laughs> this is the Oxford <laughs> Online Maths Club. We can, we can do anything. Okay. Let's set it back here as well. There we go. Okay. I oh, know it's bigger as well. It's perfect. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So you want to think about a graph where that axis going up the side is distance mm -hmm. along the path. Not, not just up and down, but distance along the path. And then... In a kind of more conventional space-time diagram here, you can track out how that monk's journey evolves. So that even if he's going slow and fast at different points on the journey, you get this kind of picture of progress along the path. Um, yeah. Um, what next? And we could and we could do a similar thing for what happens in the second day. Right. So there's a similar thing about the monk coming down again. He's going to come down from a kind of peak up here starting at the peak at 8 a.m and end up down at 12 p.m and trace out some line in the space-time diagram coming down again these are the space-time diagrams like um like uh other people wanted us to draw um so somewhere in between those parts are going to cross over each other <laughs> and i've said space-time diagrams a lot lucy points out i haven't said what a space-time diagram is i guess it's these plots like in mechanics modules right or like in mechanics options where you trace out your axes are different times and different different places, and then you trace out over time. You trace out where something is. Ah well, um, I did some confusing ones with time and space the wrong way around before. Maybe this is a more convenient more convenient one. Okay, so some sort of graph argument like this works well, um, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty good. You've got another explanation as well though, which I think I've seen someone put in chat as well. <laughs> um which is this one yeah no yeah yeah so 
So I, I think someone already mentioned that in the chat, but um, we could uh, we could solve this problem in a story-like way. So we introduced a second monk uh, who started like who spies on the first monk um, on the first day, and the, for the first monk is going up, and he um, he makes uh, he makes notes on his little notepad, um, like, and he like, just yeah. does. <laughs> and he does that he does the same thing on the second day so the second monk is going up on the second day and the first monk is coming down and of course since they're on the same trail they must cross over and um what can we say about the time when they cross over uh, the second monk is copying the first monk that means the first monk was there on the first day and the first monk is there on the second day as well because they're <laughs> meeting each other so that's one of the, that's a different solution. That's um, a more, that's the same solution, but it's in a more storytelling way. And um, the reason why this works is because the path of the monks are continuous, and that brings us to um, the intermediate value theorem, I guess. Yeah. So I'm going to put something in the further reading. I think um, this yeah. idea that. You know, um, I think like Charlie was trying to describe that they start out in one situation, they end up in another situation. It's kind of continuous, so somewhere in between, the thing must have must have switched over. Or in terms of graphs, if you've got a graph that goes up, and you've got another graph that comes down, and somewhere in between, there's this point where the graphs cross over to get from the graph going up to get to get to switch places. They have to go through the same point if they're continuous. Um, yeah. I'll put some stuff in the in the further reading about continuous functions and this thing from essentially mm -hmm. university maths about finding if, if, the, things mean. if the monks had like a teleporting abilities the problem wouldn't be um correct so yeah because yeah. the monk could the monks could teleport around one of them teleports to halfway up the mountain the top monk safely teleports down to the bottom of the mountain and then the middle one teleports up to the top of the mountain um that's if you've got introverted monks you don't want to meet each other <laughs> which actually sounds like a lot of monks um right okay <laughs> that's problem three are, are yeah. teleporting monks realistic and what do lauren and christian in chat think about this problem lauren and christian there's your cue what do you think about this problem you can say anything you like right okay um let's move on to problem four we've got about 10 minutes oh we're gonna yeah. try and fit in a couple more this one's a game yeah or branching path. So we have two, two we have two players playing the game Anna and Banana. Um, the game is on a rectangular table. The players to make their moves sequentially, and on a single move, a player puts a coin on the table so that it doesn't overlap the other coins that are already placed. And um, the, uh, and all the coins are the same same shape. And the object of the uh, the objective of a player is to put the coins in a way so that the other player can't make a move. And when that happens, the player who, uh, yeah, the player who uh, can't put, put a coin on the table loses, and the other player wins. So we need uh, we we are asking for a strategy for Anna or Banana, and that's the whole question. I'm playing out little game here. So they're taking yeah. it in turns to place coins on the table. Um, all the coins are the same size. Um, and as soon as somebody can't place a coin, so in this game, Banana is going to go for the winning move here. Banana is going to go for this one. Um, and now Anna's stuck. Anna can't place a coin. So in this example, after four moves, um, Banana has won the game cleverly. So a winning strategy would be one where... Um, a winning strategy would be one where um, no matter what the other player does, um, you always win. Sebastian's seen this one as well. Uh, somebody's described your animations, which I'm going to say. I just want to make it really clear. I had nothing to do with the animations. The animations, Idiad, um, are three blue, one brown. Are they three blue, one brown inspired as well? Um, I, I'm, I'm using exactly the same um, Python uh, stuff that um, he uses. And he, he put them on um, on a website and it's like open, um, open source. So I'm using exactly that. So it's the same thing. <laughs> right. Heavily inspired by three blue, one brown. <laughs> you've got that color scheme. You've got that computer modern font. Um, do we need any measurements? Good question. Um, so, no. It well, turns out that... uh, Ooh, we need we need one measurement. Um, we need to uh, we need one measurement that measurement that, that um, the rectangular table can have a coin. I think it can be smaller than a coin. I think we need that. But except for that, it's all right. Um, so, 
I don't I don't really know what the size of um a one pound coin is, but <laughs> I, I I think it's less than uh twenty meters by twenty meters, so we can make the rectangle table to be um let's say twenty meters by twenty meters. Okay, that's huge. This game's gonna take forever. <laughs> um, but it um it doesn't matter. Yeah, I suppose if you were gonna codify this game, if you're gonna play this with a friend, then you'd probably want to agree in advance how big's the table, how big are the coins, let's play. Yeah. Um it turns out that there's a clever answer that doesn't depend on how big the coins are or how big the table are, how big the table is. There's sort of one idea that's so great it, it works for all possible combinations of table and coin, provided you can put some coins on the table. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, if, who's going if first? The, if the rectangle, uh, Anna is going first, yeah. I might not upset um, Anna goes first and Banana goes <laughs> next. Um, so if the coin is um, smaller, if the coin is larger than the rectangle, than one of the sides of the rectangular table, then um, Anna, can't, Anna, Anna cannot uh, put a coin. So Banana wins by default in that case. Yeah, I suppose. If the table is tiny and the coins are massive, a, a case that mm -hmm. we've considered a lot in this discussion, but somehow feels not like the real world. Um, if the coins are massive and the table is tiny, then Anna has to go first, can't place a coin, instantly loses. Terrible game. <laughs> Banana's <laughs> winning strategy is, I suppose, watch Anna lose. Do nothing. <laughs> not even do nothing, right? It never comes down to Banana yeah. to decide to do nothing. Just watch Anna lose. Winning strategy. Um, the the options here for voting at the moment, and we got fewer votes than last one because this one's tougher. Um, are either either there's a strategy that Anna can follow to always win something Anna can do. Maybe a maybe an amazing first move that blows Banana out of the water um, so that Banana is completely doomed. Um, or maybe there's a strategy that Banana can always follow so that no matter what Anna does, she's haunted by Banana's moves until eventually. Anna finds that Banana has completely ruined any any future moves that Anna might have wanted to make. Um, maybe it's a, a second player winning sort of game. Uh, or maybe neither of them have a winning strategy. Uh, can they push the other coins around? No, the coins, are, the coins stay in place once they're there. Otherwise, yeah. I think the game probably goes on forever because you push the coins off the table. Um, <laughs> yeah, so some an anonymous suggestion. Can we divide it into squares? Can we think about splitting it up into little squares? Um, I think that probably helps you do a sort of pigeonhole principle sort of approach to this, of talking about where coins are. Um, yeah, but um, th that doesn't quite help because we can put the coins um, in between the squares. Yeah, you can put the coins, and it sort of matters a little bit. If a coin's in a square, it kind of matters where in the square it is because it might be influencing other nearby moves that sort of... I quite like the idea of splitting problems up. I love splitting problems up. Splitting this yeah. one into squares is a little bit tricky because the squares aren't totally separate. That you can influence other other moves that you might have wanted to make, um, or place coins over multiple squares. Um, um a, a nice strategy for like every combinatorial game is to um think about symmetry. So that's um a hint to the problem. Um. Because because symmetry always helps us to reduce the cases, and uh, it seems like there's a lot of cases in this problem, like where Anna puts his first coin, her first coin, and where Banana puts their second coin, and everything. And we could have a lot of cases, but um, if we introduce some symmetry, there could be a lot less cases and a simpler, simple strategy for someone to follow. People watching the live stream back on YouTube can't see the chat that's hiding behind the poll, so I'll read a few things out. Somebody wants to split into equilateral triangles in before somebody says um, hexagons instead. Um, we're saying banana weird because the, the names are Anna and banana, if, if, if that hasn't quite... The, it's, not, it's not a banana. It's not, you're not playing against a banana. You're playing against somebody whose name is banana. <laughs> Right, okay. Um, and uh, there is a suggestion behind, hiding behind the pole um, that this feels a bit like tic-tac-toe and uh, a good move in tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses, um, other regional variants are available, um, is to start in the middle, which has got uh, four thumbs up. I think the corner is the best move. I mean, I mean, it's it's a dead game, so it doesn't matter much. 
Whoa! Either way. I always start in the corner as well. I think you can force yeah. a draw from... Can you force a draw from either? I think you probably yeah. can. If you start in the middle, mm -hmm. it's... I think it's... Oh, is it something like... If you play the best move all the time, then it doesn't matter. You're going to draw. If you play the best move 90% of the time, but you play a random move 10% of the time, then I think you're better trying to trying to start in the middle, maybe? Ah. This is an analysis like, if you're great at darts, you should aim... If you're really good at darts, and the dart always lands where you aim it, then you should aim for the um, triple 20, because it's worth the most points, and you'll get those points. Um, if you're really bad at darts, and you're inaccurate, then you should aim for the middle of the darts board instead, because you should you need to avoid missing the dartboard and scoring no points. It's kind of how accurate you are in your intended moves can have this, like your, your variance of expectation can have, variance of expectation? Your variance can have this influence on what your strategy is. Here everyone's yeah. achieving the moves that they want to. Accuracy versus precision. Hmm. There are lots of strategies, but they all end in draw. Right, okay. Do you want to talk about what happens if Anna goes in the middle? Yeah. So, um, Anna does have a winning strategy, um, spoiler. But um, so what Anna does is Anna goes in the middle. And I put the first and I put the first move on the middle, like um, at the center of the coin is exactly at the center of the uh, rectangle, like if you intersect the triangles. And if Anna does that, there's um there's already a symmetry introduced in the um, whole setup. Because if Banana makes a move now. Um, Anna, if Anna makes a random move, then Anna can just um, reflect that coin and put that coin on the other end. I think I'm illustrating and, this life. <laughs> yeah. So she's going to mirror the and, moves. Somebody, somebody said mirror in the chat mm -hmm. and symmetry and yeah, mirroring mm -hmm. and reflecting. Yeah. Yeah. And she can uh, and and we have to prove that, uh, and we have to prove that this strategy um, works. Uh, uh, to prove that, we need to show that Anna can always reflect, and she can because if she couldn't, there was another coin uh, where where the, uh, the reflection point, and that means in some pre um, in some previous move, someone already did that, and that doesn't work because um, they're just reflecting on every move after the first one, so Anna can always reflect the move. If if but I guess yeah, I guess you could say yeah. that in the kind of forwards looking direction that if banana has a move then there must be a symmetrical space where, where anna has a move where anna will have the opportunity to make a move so we're going to keep mm -hmm. going eventually we're going to run out of table space um i guess you need that bound on it as well right to say eventually yeah. this game's going to stop <laughs> At which it's, it's not it's not an infinite rectangular table yeah and the coins are not really tiny um yeah. cool i really like these sort of symmetry arguments where you you sort of exploit the symmetry of the problem. Here it's um, Anna exploiting symmetry and winning by mm -hmm. reflecting bananas, yeah. uh, rotating bananas. Yeah, and move. Th this is an example of a combinatorial game. And um, a combinatorial game is basically two players playing sequentially and it doesn't include any chance. So in that sense, chess is a combinatorial game. And uh, we could um, also find a strategy for chess, like just like we found a strategy for this game. Where Anna always wins, and for tic tac toe or knots, um, I don't know the name exactly. I don't know. Anyway, um, knots and crosses, I think. Yeah. Uh, and th and there's a, a strategy where bo if both player plays um, optimally, they'll always draw. And we can uh, theoretically we can do that with chess as well. But since chess has like nine different pieces and like thirty two pieces altogether, it's quite um, a difficult thing to compute and. Yeah, and people. I think I think uh, I read an article saying that if people start now, I think they could they won't be able to like compute it out until like three thousand years or something. I'm not sure. Like with more, with technology now, with technology available now, um, but they, uh, uh, I read that checkers is already solved, and um, if if both party makes the optimal move, it will end in a draw always. Uh, yeah, Connect Four is all, uh, also. So that um, uh, I tried to like we were playing Connect for once, and I, I tried to look up the uh, optimal play of Connect for, but it's so complicated that um, a person couldn't memorize that. Um, our problem is simpler than that, but so uh, 
it's we have a simple strategy but in other problems in other conventional games the strategy could be um not simple we're going a little bit long i've realized it's half past five um but you know what we're getting to the end of the season um for omc so i feel like we might overrun a little bit as well hey an anonymous person who's just said someone should make an oxford online math club instagram account obviously that should be me if anybody else makes a fake Oxford Online Maths Insta Club, Maths Club, mm, I can't even say it. If anybody else makes a fake one, then don't follow, don't follow them. Right? Should we overrun very slightly and do one more problem? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's an after-school maths club where we're now going after after school. Cool. Right. <laughs> Just for you, we're overrunning into this geometry problem, but we're not going to give them much time to do this geometry problem, right? Mm -hmm. Geometry, geometry, geometry. Geometry's got this yeah. kind of history at the Olympiads. Yeah. Um, okay, here it is. It's a quadrilateral. It's got some angles marked in it. Um, and um, we would like to know the angle of ZXY. Oh, I've just realised that this might be a good one to kind of, you know, set the question, give some hints, but not show them the solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do that just to wrap up the live yeah. stream. Yeah, let's wrap up like that. Um, so here's the setup. It's a geometry problem. It looks a bit obscure. It's got some got some angles marked uh, in this kind of nice symmetrical way with rotation stuff going on. But the angles are different. It's not quite rotationally symmetric. Um, we're given three of them. We would like one more. Um, this is some angle problem. Uh, I guess we'll set the problem like this. Do you want to give them any hints or give them any advice on doing this problem? Um, we can find a lot of angles, right? Like um, since the intersection, since the diagonals are perpendicular to each other. We can use the fact that a triangle always has the sum of. If the triangle is on an Euclidean plane, then the sum of the angles of the triangle is 180 degrees. If it's not on the Euclidean plane, that's a different case. Um, but yeah, the problem is on an Euclidean plane. Molly says, I think I might have actually done it. Five yeah. exclamation marks. So it's good times. Right, okay. I'm not approving chat messages with. Um, solution methods, messages and solutions in for this one because I'm going to leave it. We might talk about it in the further reading tomorrow. Um, thank you very much, Idiad. <laughs> Thanks for coming on and showing us problems. It's been really good fun. Um, we did have a sixth one, right? You added a sixth one in. Maybe we'll stick it in the further reading tomorrow as like an extra problem mm -hmm. where we yeah. don't even have time to discuss it on the stream. Um, I want to do a couple of announcements. Um, so I'm going to hang out in chat again afterwards, like I always do. I want to do a couple of announcements. I've mentioned seasons a little bit. Um, we've started talking about this as Oxford Online Maths Club Season 1, um, which is going to have its last episode um, last episode next week. Um, uh, so that's sad news, um, end of Season 1, but great news. Um, we're going to launch Season 2, which is going to be more of this, live streams every Thursday, um, with a bit of... A bit of bit of this, a little bit more maths perhaps, a bit more interesting mathematics, more problems, more solving, uh, some familiar faces, we're going to try and get more students involved as well. Um, that's going to start uh, three weeks after that on the 22nd of April. So it's a two week break in Oxford Online Maths Club, maybe some bonus content pre-recorded might release um, in between in that two week gap to get you through those Thursdays over the Easter break. Then we're going to start season two on the 22nd of April, which is going to run uh, over that term, somebody in chat said they wanted a season three. Um, so let's just confirm season three now. After that, uh, season three is going to be another 12 or 13 episodes after that with a couple of weeks break. Uh, that one, at the moment, my plan for that one is to make that one a kind of Matt live stream over the summer. Uh, people who uh, are in year 13 might remember that we ran a Matt live stream last um, summer into into kind of October time, um, looking at Matt questions. Um, my current plan is that season three maybe focuses on Matt a bit. Um, please contact us on the email address below with whether or whether you want that sort of that sort of thing. Right, good. Okay, March highlights dropping once we're out of March as well. Someone's asked for the March highlights already. Still in March. Um, I might sneak. We got one more episode in the season, so it kind of feels like. I should sneak that one into the next highlights video as well. Right, I'm rambling. Um, that's our maths. Yeah, season three confirmed. Hooray, we did it. <laughs> what does season three mean? <laughs> it's just scheduling when there's going to be a two-week break in between seasons. I love the season concept. Right, okay. I'm planning to steadily steadily get more maths if you really want that while still having some of this character of fun stuff. Right, cool.
Uh, yeah, brilliant. Right, okay. Time to wrap up the live stream, I think. We've overrun a little bit just to get an extra geometry problem in. I'm going to hang out in chat. Thanks again to Idia. Thanks to Lauren and Christian. Um, we're going to be back in 167, episodes, 167 hours for another episode of the Oxford Online Maths Club. Um, I'll see you then. Take care. Have a nice week. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm really bad at turning this off. Uh, we can do this. We can do this. Uh, we're all going to work together on turning this off. Right, okay. We do this.